Lord Dua, thank you so much for talking to me, by the way. Um, also, fun fact about Zodwa, Zodwa is the reason why I do this, is because years, like years ago, you told me to check out Aphrodisiac to do reviews. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and I thought, okay, and I was so nervous to even like send the message to you, because I was like, I don't know, like I never really DM anyone or message yeah. anyone, anything, but you encouraged me, so thank you. No, I'm so glad you're doing it. Like we need more Black reviewers for sure. <laughs> and you are my inspiration, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to get straight into it because I don't want to keep you too long. Plus, it is absolutely baking hot and I'm melting. Yeah. <laughs> melting as we speak. Like ice cream. <laughs> um, so your current, well, your new play, which is The Darkest Part of the Night, which um, I haven't seen yet because I know it's still in tech. Yeah, tech this yeah. week. We open tomorrow. It's first oh, is it tomorrow? Yeah, first previews are tomorrow. Exciting, but nerve-wracking at the same time, but, <laughs> but exciting. Um, can you tell me about the play? Uh, the play is uh, about a brother and a sister. Um, the brother's called Dwight and the sister's called Shirley. Um, and it's about sort of they, their, their mother has just recently um, passed away and they're both trying to guess recall like how their relationship has sort of come about and trying to figure out like how do they now move forward together and I think they both have like these assumed ideas of each other or assumed ideas of like what it means to care for each other and I think what then sort of complicates or kind of makes their relationship quite complex is that um, Dwight is also autistic and I think partly I think for sure he's also having to look back on like does the loss of her mother now mean that she also then has to step in and become um, her mother and kind of take her mother's role and become like his sort of main support system? Whereas I think on the other hand, I think Dwight is trying to figure out like how does he then now sort of step into like his own um, agency? So throughout the play, we then start, we go back to the 1980s um, and sort of a kind of critical turning point of like their family's relationship and where a lot of like their foundations or and, le- and ideas, I guess, of caring and survival were like solidified and I think from that they start to sort of unpick the valuable lessons that they've they've forgotten in adulthood. Nice there are quite a few themes in your play because I know there's um, racial themes, police brutality and also even you know looking at autism um, why did you choose these themes or what because I sometimes theatre doesn't always show these themes, especially not all together as well. Yeah, I think because uh, f- for me, uh, the, the multiplicity of these themes is like the reality of my life. Mm. And it's so difficult to, to speak on one aspect, whether or not it's like um, disability and, and neurodivergence without discussing race, without discussing yeah. gender, you know, and, and, and class and all those other things. And I think for me, my, so I grew up as a child carer and my older sister, she's disabled mm-hmm. and she's non- nonverbal and has, an in- has intellectual disability. So when I think about like just the scope of like our lives, I think about all of the, I guess, sort of departments that we sort of came in contact with and how mm-hmm. all of that certainly sort of had an effect on like my sister. But also I think as people who are surrounding her, we also had that kind of a knock on effect uh, mm-hmm. or sort of had the felt the effects of whether or not it was sort of policing or social services or the doctors or the education system so and I think sometimes what happens is we have a sense certainly as sort of as, as black writers to sort of make work that is easily digestible but the reality is sometimes like our lives are so complex that I just can't simplify it for you the reality is all these things are happening all of the time. So yeah. when we look at where we place the family in the 1980s, as well as dealing with all of like the racism and the police brutality, disability and neurodivergence is also a factor. There are families that existed that were also dealing with that at the same time, that were also coming in contact with like the healthcare system. One ism doesn't stop because another one begins. They just all sort of exist together. So to be able to write a play that is certainly true of my experiences and of others, because what helped me build the play is that I sort of had conversations with my family, um, but then also had conversations with 
um, people who had disabilities and neurodivergence in Chapel Town when growing up in like the 70s and 80s and sort of built this picture of what it meant for them to exist in that time and to grow up in that time. And then to then come to a theater that says, so we'll welcome the wholeness of this play and give you space to then figure out how do we then tell the story for me has been like the blessing. And I've never, I haven't felt like as if I have to reduce or tone things down. If anything, the offer has been like, just be brave and offer us like the fullness of what it is. And then we got to this point and we met Nancy, who was a wonderful director who goes, mm-hmm. oh, I get it too. <laughs> Yeah, Nancy's really, really good. I like Nancy. Um, do you know what? It's nice because I think sometimes it's really, I think what we do lack sometimes is the voices for disability, um, especially within the Black community. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important to see these sorts of things um, on stage. Yeah. Um, would you say that what inspired you to write this play would be your own personal experiences or is it just maybe a collective of different people's experiences? It genuinely be, began at home. Okay. Um, and it, it's those moments when I, so my mother and I will be standing in the kitchen and I'll be like, what did, like, what were your, what, like, what were your thoughts of like motherhood or womanhood? And that's how things begin. Mm. And then she starts mm. talking about, you know, the, you know, finding out that actually, she, I think she found out when my sister was born that she had a disability, and then having to think about what does that then mean to raise a child specifically mm-hmm. with a disability in the 1980s in Zimbabwe, and what suddenly is on offer. So then we start talking about like her experiences of mothering, and then of what does that then mean in terms of kind of her relationship like with my father at that time, and how does that then sort of change this idea of what they think the expectations of life and expectations of relationships were. So when I was then thinking about like how that then affected my family and then thinking about sort of growing up in Leeds, I had the question of, well, what would that have meant for us if we had been born and raised in England? And how did, so I think a lot of like what I understand of my sister's sort of support and the services that she gets, she never got in Zim. So I'm having to then understand like, what her like day center is like and how that day center would have been different you know when she was born what does like how did like the kind of the care system change so from kind of institutionalization into like kind of the care in the community so we wouldn't have been growing up with her you know she probably would have been institutionalized so who was then getting institutionalized then you go meet people who were talking about you know um a, a hospital for example in leeds called meanwood um park hospital and doing the research on meanwood you find out those people who were either deaf to like schizophrenic were all in like the same ward. And the notion of institutionalization was so common. And I go, but I can't imagine that being my sister's experience because I can't imagine her not being a part of like our everyday life. And then slowly the place started to grow because once you then go, this is where they live geographically, but then you go, okay, but what was happening geographically around that time? Then you go, okay, so this is the community that they live in. This is like the site that they live in. And then slowly like the place starts to grow. Mm-hmm. And for me, what was really interesting in like writing about, so the, the, the play is about a, um, Jamaica, a family of Jamaican heritage and thinking about, well, how does the language kind of come into play? Because Chapel Town at the time is, like, is predominantly kind of a Caribbean community. So thinking about how they exist as a community and somebody who's grown up in like that community as well and hearing how language plays and like the language that you have at home and the language that you have outside and the language that you have in schools and the language that you have like when you're dealing with like the police. And slowly like we start to sort of build this family that is so much like a part of like the community but also slightly the side of it because yeah. all of the other friends and all of like the, their friends' siblings are, are not people with disabilities or neurodivergence. So as much as they are part of the community, they also feel like they're slightly ignored mm-hmm. in that community. And I think we also knew what that felt like because our friends didn't have, you know, sisters who had disability. So we were on a different schedule. Yeah. And, but how does, so I had all these questions about like, but you've also never said what that was. You just lived it but you actually never said it out loud. Like, this is what our experience was. And I didn't have the language as well of being a child carer. Like that's something that I learned later on in life. 
because we were just doing life. We were just surviving. Then suddenly when you start looking back, you go, actually, this is what it was. That encounter with that police officer, that encounter with that social services was this. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly what you have labeled as just every day or normal, you realize actually it's also embedded with trauma. And some things were not okay. But Mm -hmm. until we're able to kind of look back on that, you just keep going and thinking that that was okay. And it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I think what's been really lovely in some of the conversations, I think with the cast and the crew is like talking about what survival mode really means actually. Yeah. And the trauma that being in survival mode can create. Mm-hmm. And then you end up with this family that are trying as best as they can to also maintain joy, to also maintain love in the midst of everything else. It's interesting because it is, you're right about survival mode and these characters are in a way they're there, well, they are trying to survive as children, but also as adults with the loss of their mum. And as you're saying, you know, for you, for your sister, for your family, you guys were in serious survival mode as well. Mm. Um, And it's hard when you don't have the support from professionals. Yeah. Because that's what you sometimes you need professional support, and yeah. even no matter where you are, whether it's in the Western world, wherever it is, sometimes that support is just not there, and not and unfortunately, sometimes the support can be quite can be quite racial as well. Yeah, um, and, can, and it can make a massive impact. Like I think people sometimes don't realize how you know for for us it's hard sometimes to get that support or get the correct support or the yeah. or an equal support as well. Yeah. And I think that, that when you are, there's moments like in, in the play where the family simply needs support or also needs to be heard and understood. Yeah. But what's coming before that is like this white gaze and mm-hmm. then one that also then racializes them and then ignores them and then makes these assumptions about them. So before we even tackle that, what happens to the help and support and understanding that I needed? So that yeah. then takes a back burner before we then even deal with all of like the compounding issues that this then kind of creates. And then it makes it so difficult for you to then think about accessing any type of help. Yeah. So there's moments even within the play, particularly like when the parents are talking and they're talking about who they were before they were parents and realizing that as much as like they're trying to do their best, they also have like their own grief of what they thought life was going to be yeah. and the ideas of like being enough but they didn't have enough time to say actually I'm struggling with something because they were just trying to survive the everyday and like 1980s and I was said 1981s so like you go racism and police brutality and then high unemployment then you go what does it mean to be a man to then provide for your family and so it's just like one thing after another and at some point you don't get time to deal with like your own hurts. So then that's when we start thinking about generational trauma. What yeah. do you then pass on down to your kids? So with these, with, with Dwight and Shirley, now they have to sort of unpick um, what did we inherit, but also what do we want to leave behind in order for us to move forward together? Mm-hmm. Because that becomes, if we don't do that, that becomes the curse of generational trauma. Yeah. And we, we don't want that. We, we want to also have hope that mm-hmm. actually we can have joy and that rest belongs to us joy belongs to us too mm-hmm. you know generation belongs to us too i just the notion of just constantly existing in hardship is not the sole definition of my life and i don't want that to be for everybody else like healing is yours too yeah definitely and healing is something that we need so we need so much of especially with generational trauma healing is Something that we don't quite have all the time, yeah. but we need, we need yeah. it big time. You go for it, go on. I was going to say, like, I, I find myself more and more with the work that I'm creating so hung up on healing. Mm. And I'm like, I can keep talking about <laughs> it in so many different ways because yeah. I want to also know what soft life means. <laughs> It's so true. This soft light, I'm very ready for it. Or oh, I always say, I want the milk and honey. Like you know, when when yeah. the um when sorry, there's a can you hear that? Yeah. When the um when the Egyptians were 
you know, in the, uh, well, the Israelites were in the, um, in that, in the place of nowhere, really. And all they yeah. wanted was just the milk and honey. I just want, I want that soft life of just milk and ha- honey. I want it. I just want it. And I think I want to be able to, to know how to heal myself. Yeah. So that when I think about the things that I then pass on, you know, mm-hmm. to my children, my future children, and don't have children. I mean, husband, come. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like my future children, I also want them to grow up knowing that actually joy is theirs. And yes. it's just like a default. Yeah. Like before they even go out into the world, actually just know that these things belong to you. Mm-hmm. And it's not a privilege to have them. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of fact. And I think to avoid, I think, dealing with these things or confronting these things, for me, I just think, God, then I'm going to pass on the sadness, mm-hmm. I'm gonna pass on this trauma. And I don't want that because the world is doing enough already. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Bad. Like it's it's giving us more than enough to deal with, mm-hmm. but at home, like if you're gonna leave my household, you're gonna leave knowing your love. You're gonna leave yeah. knowing you are the definition of love, and you are allowed to rest, and you're allowed mm-hmm. your time, and you're allowed to decide what you say yes and no to. Not everything is about you being in a place of like lack and denial all of the time. Like it just will not be. Um, yeah. But that takes work. That just takes generational work. It does, and um, I guess we are the generation to do this because I think we we're so aware of yeah. we've got so much resources now more than any other oh, like you know our parents wouldn't have the resources we have because thanks to social media and just like the internet and stuff and we know we know that soft life is possible because we can see it we see I see it daily people on you know you see it on influencers they're living a very nice well we think they are, I don't know um soft life and we know it's there we know happiness it can be achieved um but it's just allowing us to have that experience yeah. whether it's and I guess your stories and your writing is therapy in a way therapy uh for people watching it but also I'm hoping it has some kind of therapeutic aspect for yourself as a writer I think part, parts of it do but it's also mm, I've got to tap into something to write it yes very so true. what's been really helpful in doing this show is having a drama therapist on board but then also realizing just certainly with development how important it is to make that space for emotional support and mental support for creatives and I'm going to be working as a drama tech for um Tid Fauzi and we've talked a lot about like what I've not had in my in my kind of career and what I'd love to facilitate for writers because it's all wonderful to say you know you are going to create this product at the end that is like so emotionally harrowing and it's beautiful mm-hmm. but you got to tap into something in order to get that mm-hmm. and what happens to you when you drain yourself of those things and you leave it on the page like where do you then go yeah. and then what are all of like the steps that you go through to to bring about this production what is your encounter with like that company what is your encounter with that production team and I think when you haven't also had the the chance to unpick how you exist in the world and then how you exist as a black creative in this predominantly white industry you then go in sometimes with practices that either are silencing you Mm-hmm. or that you suddenly go oh I should be so like grateful and apologetic for this but actually no you, you you're allowed to occupy space and occupy space in a way that enables you to make work in a healthy way yeah. you're allowed to occupy space in a way that allows you to also say can I experiment too can I also help can I figure out what form I want to play with so I think the, during the process of doing this show the depth of kind of conversations that we've had We've not, I don't think it would have been right to have had them without the drama therapist because we then go, what if I, what if I had to tap into to make this, to write the show? Yeah. I then have to ask the actors, what are you going to tap into to have a conversation about grief? You know, yeah. where did that come from? You know, what is Nancy also equally sort of tapping into in order for her to be able to kind of direct the show? And yeah. I think being able to have that level of support now, I'm, I'm able to say actually for my next thing, 
this is what I'm going to say I require. Mm. It's not a small task. It really yeah. is into these things and i think more and more we have to start recognizing how much support is needed and it really isn't just about text it's not it's about the whole holistic experience of making work yeah definitely do you know i was going to ask you about because you were telling me before about how how the set looks and those sorts of things did you have any creative or do you ever get to have any kind of creative um input especially towards this play i know sometimes it's not the case. Mm. Uh, I think it kind of depends on like the, the type of right that you are. Like I, I genuinely enjoy getting to the point where you go for like the model um, kind of presentation mm-hmm. and you're like, there's a massive cucumber and it's going <laughs> to like come down. And you're like, how did we get here? But then like, <laughs> when you, you start to understand, there's no cucumber in the show, by the way. But like, <laughs> when you start to understand like, the kind of designer's take on the show I find that really interesting because yeah I, I, I my mind just doesn't go there because it's just not my skill set mm. so like if ever it's really weird I, I'd say something but to date it's just been really cool so like what's there's a lot of music in the show and a lot of music that's like you know we've got like disco and funk and then we've got like jazz and we've got reggae and music is such an important uh, factor in connecting the family but also like mm-hmm. a source of uh, a mode of com- communication for for the Dwight okay. so what's, I genuinely wouldn't have thought about this but like what's been so cool the, um, that Jean has done is like the floor has got this massive revolve which is like a record so that allows us to think about like how do you go back in time and how do you reverse time and how do you like you know um, curate your memories and DJ your memories. It's just like I I wouldn't have done that. I I yeah, genuinely yeah. don't know how to do that. But I love that collaborative process of doing data because somebody will come with a very cool idea, a very cool take on what you've written, and then you go, okay, yeah, let's let's do it, let's go. You know that is now that you said that kind of because you could even do like in my brain I'm now overthinking things but you could even I guess if they just want to do like a little scratch you know like if you were listening to hip hop you know, you know back in the day yeah. they would do like a little scratch so this which could be again rewind of a memory or something that's really cool yeah. it's really really cool I I would never do that at all no and then Jean comes in and it's like of course why why wouldn't we do that you know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that I really, really like that. And I think that's what I really love about like this the notion of like kind of collaboration because it's like what happens when you know you partner a beatboxer and a contemporary dancer and a poet. And like what magic do you make? Can you go, mm. go figure that stuff out? Yeah, yeah. It's just an explosion of art. Which yeah. Is nice. So what I've seen the last one of the one of the plays I saw, actually one of the first plays I saw during lockdown when plays were coming back was nine lives at the bridge yes that's at the bridge thank you couldn't remember it was which i really enjoyed um so you wrote loads of plays and actually you know before i even though i know that you wrote loads of plays i had a double check i was like oh my gosh someone's wrote loads of stuff (laughs) i'm just allowing i write stuff literally you are just a writer all stages um is there one play that you love more or what's your favorite play let's just say it's that what is your favorite play picking <laughs> children I know I knew you were gonna say that <laughs> um I feel like there's there's two I, I think that okay. the, the, the thing that for example like boy boy that taught me so many lessons about writing Mm. and about just crafting story mm. about how plays are made and like meeting the uh, the different like kind of co-producing companies like I remember just sitting in so many meetings just to listen and that for me was like the, a massive lesson yeah yeah over the years I think what's been really interesting with nine lives is that when I wrote it literally around the time is boy boy as well um which is now like what eight years ago it was like this really small play that was part of like a commission with the Leeds Playhouse and it was like hour long it was with the Leeds Playhouse and Aaron Moore in uh Glasgow 
-hmm. and it was like a part of like a play a pint and a pint and it was like this afternoon theater they come in they eat they watch a piece of theater I think then it was just like I, I think I didn't get or I wouldn't have known what it would go on and do yeah, yeah. at that time it was just like this really small play that was going to be part of this thing that I was going to do and I knew when the themes of the play and all about kind of migration and refugees and asylum seekers I thematically I got it I know I knew what it, it was doing yeah. but I, over the last few years the fact that it, it's all, of all the plays it's the one that always comes back yeah always definitely always back. it's been like republished twice this year oh, wow. and it it's toured to, uh, it's been to France. It was recently in South Africa. And then you go looking at immigration through the prism of what's happening currently yeah. South Africa with a lot of like Zimbabwean um, migrants going in there and like the xenophobia that's happening. Mm. I, I genuinely wouldn't have known that's what that play was going to do. And then it went to the House of Parliament and then it, it was part of like a gala for um, the UK Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group. Like they had a fundraiser with the Ian McKellen like it, it just I wouldn't have known and suddenly I go yeah but you also can't predict what play is going to do what yeah have like what connection and will continue to have a kind of connection with um, audiences all I really could do was just write the stories that spoke to me at that time and I think equally when I think about Darkest as well I think it's always been one of those plays where I started it like initially it was a very very short play that I did on my MA in 2013 and then it was just about Dwight and Shirley and it was just, just the church and the day of the mother's funeral and then it's just kind of kept growing and become what it is today but I've always known like there's something about that character Dwight and what happens when you place him at the center of the story and when mm -hmm. it sort of gets to meet him like on his terms and also there's something really special about seeing him on stage but it's just about figuring out like how do we see him and I think slowly this whole process has really made it my, my new favorite play mm -hmm. learned so much about myself and process and about persevering with plays mm -hmm. like I persevered with this play and even the times when I didn't get it and the times when it was just purely Dwight drafts for like two years it was just Dwight drafts and the whole experience of sort of seeing this family in a way that they're so terribly broken but also filled with so much love because really what they do is just trying their best yeah being able to sort of craft this and kind of get into a point where the the cast were coming in and i was like god i hope i hope you get them like i hope you get that get the nuances of who they are and get that they're just genuinely trying their best and when you have conversations with the actors and they're like no no i get it because that's something that I understand of self. Then I go, okay, great. <laughs> I'm so glad. So now I'm at a point where I think I wouldn't have been able to sort of get to this phase because I think I'm also doing my own growing and changing. Yeah. Now in this new phase of understanding healing and brokenness, and I start to look at my work differently, then I go, actually, you are my favorite play now because you also speak to who I am right now as a person and speak to sort of the conversations that I want to be having you know with audiences yeah. so I think it's about the phases that you can go through in life but right now this one yeah, yeah it's coming up to be honest with you I don't blame you because for me it sounds like a play that's just so relevant to everything mm -hmm. and it makes sense like what you're working on and what you've just done now will be most relevant to you right now yeah as well so that totally makes sense what inspires you to write because you wrote so much stuff yeah people are just really fascinating <laughs> <laughs> they really are even like the ones that do some really weird shit like <laughs> just it's really fascinating and i think i don't know whether or not it's like the introvert in me but like i'm always just like sitting and watching Mm. I'd be like why though like mm. why are you doing that thing and like what makes you do that thing and like how do we sit beside like one another and what happens if I do x and it has a ricochet on y I think that's the thing I'm just always like curious about like yeah but why though mm. why is that happening and that's what makes me want to write 
or it sort of makes like generates the ideas like the writing task is a whole different thing because like that's 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 hard <laughs> and like but there's always like this collection I think mm -hmm. of like events and thoughts and I, I see it like when I'm on the bus or something you know you you watch how people sort of exist together and even like the, the idea of so the thing that's been on my mind lately has been around the nature of community and you see how in this concept in southern Africa around like Ubuntu and Ubuntu is about like community and like I am because you are and how I'm not seeing that a lot yeah. but what happens what's what's the choices that people make to go I'm going to serve me and forego community because we don't live in isolation so the more that I sort of watch what's sort of going on around the world and you go but what what is that and where does that come from and also yeah. wh where does it end and does it just kind of continue and like having come back from from Zimbabwe recently for me Zim becomes like an example of what happens when you, you constantly keep choosing the individual over community to the point that the country is so run down and it feels like there's this lawlessness and there isn't a sense of like community and I can't see where it ends because this already feels bad but it feels like it, it can get worse and it's like but what does worse even look like so I do that a lot of times and then I'll like journal and I'll and I'll keep asking questions and sometimes it feels like that's what the writing is like the, the entire play is a question you know the entire play becomes a, a, a pondering on something of, of an idea and I never like to write something that goes this is the answer because also equally I don't know what the answer is yeah, yeah, I'm also yeah. just experiencing life as you are you know and hopefully we'll just kind of come to the theater and then we also leave going oh I didn't notice that but I see it now mm -hmm. what does that mean <laughs> yeah yeah it's so true do you find because obviously you're saying because you come with these creative ideas then as you're saying writing is a whole different mm -hmm thing but then you also you're also a lecturer as well in writing yeah so actually you are just an all-rounder great writer then <laughs> oh I don't know about that um I think I think what 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 I've learned of myself is that I I can't turn off the creativity yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's just always there mm. and it's like partly we were talking about like my Instagram earlier and I think suddenly there's this kind of like interest in photography and like in, in what does photography say of self and like what do you capture of self so then I just start playing with ideas and concepts so yeah. sometimes I'll get to my family and like I'm like to my mom listen so this is the concept we're gonna be good and she's like why and I'm like because I, I, I can't turn it off I'm always wondering what what do these things kind of look like and, and, what, and how fun creativity can be yeah. So the idea of like sort of playing photography now, I'm realizing like that's my that's my rest because like my therapist mm -hmm. kept saying like you have to find like an activity that is like your rest and I was like I don't do yoga but I can <laughs> I can make stuff I can craft stuff so that's what I do. When I then go to lecture, I actually think that f partly it's, it's rest, but also this just universities and admin that's not rest. Mm -hmm. But like what's interesting about working with students is that even though I won't be writing, but being in a space where ideas are being discussed, I realize actually I can hold, whether it's like 30 students, I can hold their individual ideas. I mean, I don't know everybody's name, but I'm gonna know that's your idea. <laughs> and you can then do all of like the puzzle pieces of like, what's the story? And I really enjoy that. Like I genuinely yeah. love doing that bit. And I think that's one of the things that's made me want to be a dramaturg is because it's that thing of holding space for people. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. People. Um, I just think it's really fun. I really do. And it, I, I'm, I'm like the creative sibling, you know, but like, I can't tell you how it began. Like I, it just is there. It's, it's definitely you, a hundred, you are a hundred percent creative because every time I see one of your posts, I'm like, no, every day you're getting more creative. Literally. <laughs> I remember this was ages ago when you said to me that you were going to paint some trainers. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, and then, and then it has moved from tra painting, designing trainers You've created like, like I remember you made some. I think it was like a gold crown or something. Yeah, the hair pieces. We yeah. had like Carrie Shell's face that I made like <laughs> cow horns. Yeah, that's cow your horns. recent one, right? The white cow horns. And yeah, I was like, cow horns. Yeah, like it's so fun. How? Did, I mean, I was like, no, Zotwa is literally a craft machine because you are creating so things. 
I think I don't know what it is. Like it I just can't imagine not ever doing it. I you need really, to open up an Etsy store so people can actually also you know enjoy I your stuff. This. I literally thought about this. Like, there's another thing um, that my mom and I were designing. Um, she's literally like my creative director. My <laughs> so <laughs> we made like this beaded like um, wig, and I was saying to her, like, we need to open up like a craft shop, like you just and sell all of our stuff. You because must have it just like accumulating <laughs> in the house. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna do with these cow horns, but <laughs> they're there now, and we just sell them. You actually should because this is so random. But yesterday I was looking on TikTok and there was this woman and she she sells like diamonte wigs made from diamontes and she was saying that she's that people like Doja Cat and yeah. um, Cardi B they all brought them just simply because they might need it for like a performance or shit. And these days people are going okay. they're going all out. So this yeah. is your time. This is your errand. If you sell those, then you can have a soft life. This this is where my soft life money is coming from. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I love theater, but you're paying me my soft life quality. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would love to like just have something, but it's finding the time to do everything. Yeah, that, it that is. Thing. It really is, and like there's so many like kind of core things happening, and you go, okay, when do I find time to also write the TV script that I owe, and then like mm-hmm. the other play that I owe over here, and it's like what I'm learning is that you don't miss your opportunity because I think that's always my biggest worry is like if I don't do everything now I'm, I'm never going to get another shot but actually no I'll, I'll create space where yeah. I get another shot and my audience will come whether or not it's yeah. like Etsy shop or it's like the theater th- they will come you know mm-hmm. that, that's it but I have to also equally be kind to myself and not chase money <laughs> it's true it's so true I have some quick fire questions for you this is my okay. little quick fire ones so the first one is your favorite theater space the kiln obviously (laughs) (laughs) nice very nice um your favorite play of all time it could be any place it could be a play that's inspired you or favorite play of all time i don't know if i have a favorite play but i still have a favorite playwright okay yeah Uh, that's august wilson like i'm a sucker like did you watch um jitney yes i did i love jitney andrew french was in jitney's in this now um yeah. oh yeah he was and wasn't he also in uh two trains running as well yeah and then he also in, he was in boy boy so i've known andrew for a long time um but yeah august wilson i don't even care like it can be he a is bad, good. like nursery production of like <laughs> do you know what i found out the other day was that august wilson the characters are in every single they feature in different plays yeah. like a marvel film basically yeah it's a, that that i think that's literally like my goal it's like I'm gonna do like this collection of plays. I'm not sure. I probably should have started the series earlier, but like I, I need to do my thing, my Pittsburgh series, and figure out like what does that look like. Mm-hmm. And do, like see, because in here, like you see families in sort of in different um, generations. Yeah. And I'm like, maybe that's the thing that I do. But I don't know. I, I just love his work. I really, I love the way that yeah. like, he writes people like or doing ordinary life, but it's like Very ordinary much. black folks. And like we interrogate, like I'd love a talking play, like just two people on stage. If I ever had seen Viola Davis and Denzel Washington in Fences, like my life would have been just complete. <laughs> I just love that. And I think also realizing yeah. like, that sense of like the study of people is also how like my films are turning out. Mm-hmm. Just people doing life when we watch them and they talk. And I'm like, yeah, August Wilson. Yeah, he, I agree. He's a fantastic playwright, fantastic. Um, Dream guest to someone you would like to watch your new play. They could be dead or alive. Someone to watch my play. Um, Viola Davis. I think she's amazing. Nice. Always Wilson to just come back and then just watch my play. Watch the play. Um, I think John Carney. I think he's a great actor. Uh, he's a South African actor. I'd love him to come see my work. Um. I don't know somebody like I think what I love so for example like when you think about like Denzel Washington mm-hmm. he's like equally does theater and film and you go that's type of person that type of person that says I see the version of this on stage but I see the mm-hmm. version it could be in film and I see the version it could be in television somebody who can do that because I think I'm starting to think more and more about like how do my 
plays and translate into kind of TV. Mm. So when you look at, for example, a TV show like P Valley, mm. that was a play, you know, by Katori Hall. I didn't you know, know that. that. Yeah, yeah. So like when you think about how ideas now and kind of how pieces of work are not being adapted. Yeah. Anybody who's going to come and watch this play and go, oh, I see how this can work now in a different form. Like they need to come hit me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need you need an all rounder. I need an all rounder who gets it. Yeah, know? genuinely so get it. So we should say Denzel Washington then. Denzel is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's a collection of them. All of all of them. Come all of them. <laughs> what has been your proudest career moment to date? um to date I think this play <laughs> I really think this play um I, I partly I, I oh God, there's been so many cool things that's happened in the last year I'm I'm doing um a this play has, has certainly taught me a lot about what happens when you are, you are brave and you say what it is? Mm. And I, I think as, as much as I've, I've been making, I think, good work, yeah. something about the depth of the honesty and being actually so unafraid to go, but actually this is what it is. This is what it was. This was the, the experience. And there's no other way I could have sugarcoated it. And I think it's taken a while to kind of get to that place where you're so unbound and you can just say what it is. And then on top of that, I think I feel like I'm in a phase of my career whereby I'm genuinely doing the work that I always dreamed I'd do. Yeah. Way back when, in like poetry days, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait till I'm also doing theater, then I'm also doing film, then I'm also doing television. And that's exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the phase I'm in. And I'm having to learn how to be in the present day of that rather than go, oh, since I'm already here, what's the thing that's already up here? And it's like, actually... Yeah, no, babe, like you are, you are balancing like the, the, the theater and you, you're writing a feature film and you, you're on two TV shows. Like, yeah. You're what doing, else? Yeah, you're doing it. Really, and truly, right now is your proudest moment because yeah. you're literally doing everything that you aspired and hoped to be when, you know, when you started out with poetry and you are now, you're doing stuff. We're literally doing stuff. And I think it's so easy to, to, to shift the goalpost. Yeah. And they're like, you must be doing more now. You must be doing five TV shows. I actually, no, like, I, there was time when I had nothing, yeah, you know, but yeah. like, it, it, this is the moment that I'm sort of living in. But it's, it's become a practice to recognize that. Whereas I think years ago, I was always living in the future, always living in the, when I am that person and I'm doing that thing, actually we're here now. And I think if I don't take stock of that, I will miss this. Then I'll be chasing whatever next goalpost it is and then exhaust myself again over there and then feel like I'm not enough over there when actually I think I'm so proud of like where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. But I could always do more. <laughs> <laughs> you have room for more, but you're doing loads. Um, so my last question for you is what is next for you? TV. Nice. TV stuff that's coming out that I genuinely never thought I'd do. I really didn't think I'd do. And I think one thing I've always wanted was to be able to do different things, mm -hmm. you know? But then I think sometimes when you come into the industry, you're trying to find ways to pigeon you, pigeonhole you. Yeah. When actually I've always been like, no, I want to do comedy and I want to do drama and maybe do fiction. And I think by building up that portfolio of work and like having those conversations I'm able to kind of go into like those areas now so that's the stuff I'm working on and I think I've always said to like people I just give me time to figure it out then I'll figure out how to write that comedy that yeah, yeah. I just need the chance to figure out how to do it mm -hmm. and then I'll sort of deliver it so now I'm making more room to do more television which is what I really really wanted um to be in and it feels like sort of the right time to do that now um and I'm just so excited for stuff to come out because like you start projects like a year ago a year and a half ago and I'm like when can I tell people I just want to <laughs> so I'll tell you soon <laughs> yeah please just tell me before everyone else <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the what was announced was the channel 4 one dance school so I'm writing an episode of them 
Nice. Yeah. Can you tell me more about it? Or so dance school um, is about uh, a group of young dancers who are, and it's a whole series is set in Leeds, which is like where I grew up. It was so exciting to have like more like Northern based um, work. And it's about kind of young people who attend like a Saturday um, dance school. Um, and then you also have like a young people who also attend like a kind of contemporary dancey, schooly other thing. Um, I'm so promoting it so well. Um, but it's about kind of like what does um, dance mean to them and what does it mean for them to sort of grow up like in this, um, in this city and you, what's so lovely is about exploring like this ensemble cast and also there's like generational kind of differences of kind of what dance has been for them so like the character Jackie who runs like the Saturday dance school called the Jackie uh Jackie Lee ensemble she grew up as a dancer the black female dancer in Chapel Town you know so we're looking at like what dance how dance shaped her like you know in the 80s and 90s and then like how kind of dance sort of evolved like in the city and also kind of nationally with this kind of young people and like what does it mean for you to you know chase after kind of your ambition and what is like the cost of that so it's been really really lovely kind of being in the writer's room as well because as a playwright you're doing a lot of stuff on your own mm -hmm. but now you're able to do a lot of like this developmental work like with a team of people and then the way that you write is different because it's just for me it's so lovely and like I just needed community certainly after like lockdown I just yeah it. exactly and it's so lovely to write right with a team of people I'm excited for this yeah when <laughs> when does it because this you're right with tv it is such a slow burner because yeah. there's a whole process of it like getting creating it then getting actors getting it filmed all these things and then finding a date when it does finally yeah broadcast do you know that have they given you like any info on that uh no i don't know when it comes up but i know we're shooting at the back end of this year oh brilliant yeah so the the, the kind of from writing to like filming like that turn on is quite quick so it must be like kind of early next year but like the other stuff that i sort of started last year yeah that's not coming on to like end of next year and that's just like so frustrating because like that's yeah. the one I need to look at look at i mean look at them all but like that one. <laughs> That was shiny. <laughs> like, look at it too. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for there's so many things. I'm so excited for you. You awesome. deserve all of it. So I'm super excited. Listen, um, powered through these years. Oh Lord. <laughs> and and look, and you've and look where you are. And sometimes you know, as they say, hard work pays off and perseverance is key. And you know, yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing that they don't really tell you a lot is like is like how difficult perseverance is. Yeah. And like whilst you're in the midst of it, genuinely having faith in self and like faith in the process. And also equally learning how to just take care of yourself in the midst of it. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can very easily kind of get so disheartened. And now I'm just like actually I'm so glad of the moments that I didn't quit. I really, really am. But I also had to not do it in like this romantic sense of being like it's okay let me be struggling artist no I was like I'm not gonna struggle I'm also gonna like eat and go do two other jobs but also also go sleep <laughs> and just figure out like how to just keep a healthy yeah. persevering state of mind yeah no definitely I'm so excited for you Zodla. Zodla, thank you so so much for talking it's been so nice talking to you it's good to um, you too